can everyone, I, I'm hoping that you can all hear me clearly. So yeah, um, and just to maybe continue the introduction of myself, I, um, my background is as a, 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 a civil engineer, I'm actually a chartered civil engineer, but um, having started working in construction, um, I was became more interested in, in the contracts and, and legal side, and as Kenneth said, the, the risk management side of, of things. So that led me to do a, a law degree and then later an oil and gas law master's degree. So I've got the sort of practical background of being on sites and understanding the sort of the world of, of construction, as well as um, having the, the, the uh, sort of law background. So what we're going to talk about today is the standard of care in, in, in contracts. So when as professionals, we're working on contracts, um, whether it be as a sort of uh, maybe a, a construction professional or an archaeologist or, or whatever, um, the contract will also always define or um, contain something in there that sets out what is expected of you as, as, a, as a professional um, doing, doing some work. And there are pitfalls in what your contract might say that you could fall into if you're not careful. So this is what we're talking to, about today. And the main pitfall is inadvertently signing a contract that says that you will do something that is fit for purpose. So fit for purpose is obviously a, a quite a popular phrase that, as we can see from these headlines that I just took out of, um, you know, of you know, general um, websites and, and, and newspapers and what have you, it's um, a, a, a bandied about phrase that's used quite commonly and it's got a sort of commonly understood term but actually um, in legal terms and in contract terms it's actually got a, a quite a specific legal purpose that um, a legal meaning should I say that, that actually sort of means something and it's, it effectively sets out the standard of care that somebody doing any work under a contract is, is, is done is expected to do and the reason that as professionals providing professional advice that we don't want to be um, signing up to a fit for purpose provision will come clear from hopefully from what I'm going to be saying over the next 20 minutes or so. So, as I said, um, it's, it's got a, a strict legal meaning and effectively what saying that something is fit for purpose means is that um, whatever you're doing or providing under a contract means that the thing that you are doing or providing will absolutely strictly comply with the performance criteria that is expected of, of, the, of the thing that you are, are doing. And even if um, uh, something happens and you, and you, as a professional, do everything, use reasonable skill and care and, and, and do everything, um, properly as far as being a professional like as I say archaeologist uh, civil engineer quality um, you know architect whatever um, if you've if you have done everything properly and not been negligent in your work and whatever you have, de have designed or produced fails to be fit for, for purpose and you've signed a contract that says you're going to do that you can be liable for it so just to sort of try to put it in more sort of um, easy to understand terms there are different standards as to what one, a person signing a contract or, or doing any work is expected to do, depending on what the nature of the work is that you are providing. So if you are somebody that is manufacturing goods or building works, then the, ex the, the standard that is expected of you is fit for purpose. So let's just sort of backtrack and, and sort of think about what that means. So if as a uh, construction, if you're a construction contractor, then it is expected that if you build a bridge at that uh, and it is expected to last for 25 years, say, that that bridge will get your traffic from A to B. It will not crack, it will not fail, it will not collapse. And you will be expected as a construction contractor professional to build something that, that will perform all of those tasks and functions and perform in a certain way on a more sort of easy to understand sort of day-to-day 
um, level, it also applies to people supplying goods. So if I go to the shop and I buy a kettle and I uh, um, exchange good money and take this kettle home with me, then I have a reasonable expectation that it will um, boil water um, in a reasonable time over the expected life of that kettle. I want to be able to boil water in my kettle for what's reasonable late like five years without it getting silted up or failing or whatever. So it's, it's, so anybody that, that builds bridges or manufactures kettles is, expect, is expected to commit themselves to provide the goods or the, or the works that will meet those standards. However, and this is the important point, when it is somebody that is a professional person providing um, advice and services, the standard is different and the common law standard that is expected of, of these professionals providing advice and services is not fit for purpose. It is that you're expected to use reasonable skill and care. So um, provided that you have used reasonable skill and care, um, then it is not expected that you have to meet such a strict absolute standard as, as if you're providing goods or works. So, for example, um, if, uh, you know, OK, we're talking in the sort of um, archaeological world here, you're not expected to um, identify every single, uh, forgive me, I'm not, a, I'm not in your world, so I might be saying stupid things here, but you're not expected to go and identify and date and name every single thing that is in your, in your, on your site within 20 minutes of its, of its, of its um, life, you know, you're just, a bit, it's, it's what's reasonable in the, in the circumstances, what any other architect, architect archaeologist, given the, the same scope of work, would be expected to do in, in the same circumstances. A doctor is a professional. A doctor is not expected um, to make every patient, patient better. You know, the doctor goes in, um, does whatever the best, that, you know, reasonable to a reasonable level of skill and care that a doctor is expected. You're not gonna 100% cure every single patient but a doctor has to be performed to the standard that is expected of a doctor. A lawyer isn't going to win every case in court, but you know, you'll only get a, um, a lawyer sued if they're, if they're negligent, they fail to meet the, 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 the standard that's reasonably expected of a professional. And it's, it's, it's important that when we're working under contracts that your construction contractor or your kettle provider, yep, they can sign up to a contract that their kettle or their bridge will be fit for purpose. But us on the professional side of doing work need to not sign up that our services, our advice will be similarly fit for purpose. We only be what wants to be expected to have done what's what's um, reasonably expected of a suitably experienced and qualified professional, and that is using the appropriate level of reasonable skill and care. And as I say, we'll we'll, we'll find out why, why this matters shortly. Just to give a bit of background that this this is established how English law works is it's established by practice and case law over over the years and then things get put into statute to, to reflect that so just as a backup um, just to let you understand that this, these um, these two different standards of care it actually is put into statutory uh, English law so we've got the um, the sale of goods act 1979 which again is talking about supply of goods and there's actually an implied term that goes into any contract of a sale of goods that actually says that you have a reasonable right to expect that all goods that have been manufactured or, or supplied by somebody will be fit for purpose for which the goods are normally used or supplied. So again, when I go and buy my kettle, if I haven't got a, if the contract doesn't say anything about the standard of the kettle I'm, I'm buying, this Sale of Goods Act will imply a term into that contract that says that I am reasonably entitled to expect that my kettle will be fit, fit for its purpose. So I can go back to the shop and the shop can say, well, you didn't have that in your contract. And I can say, well, yes, I have, because this, um, this uh, Sale of Goods Act implies that, that term into my contract for the goods that they will be fit for purpose. And it's also, it goes a bit further than that, that if it's a specific purpose and the buyer of the goods tells the manufacturer 
or the, should I say the seller of the goods that they want to use whatever it is they're buying for a particular purpose and the seller says yes you can use whatever I'm selling you for that purpose then again it becomes an implied term that if that whatever it is doesn't then meet that standard again you have an obligation to sort of compensate that person so moving on to services it's it's similarly also set in the statute law in the UK that um, as a professional um, when we're providing services you're only expected to use reasonable skill and care so again if you go and engage an architect to deal with your house uh, you know or planning or whatever or you provide uh, or an engineer or an archaeologist or a whatever, whenever, whenever you're providing, um, engaging a professional for anything uh, on a, um, and you have a sort of contractual commitment with such a professional, rather than it being a, an Im implication in your contract that that person will provide the service and they will be fit for purpose. So your architect says, you know, your house will never fall down, whatever. If, or the, the structural engineer says your house will never fall down whatever your structural engineer is actually only expected to do the design to the reasonable skill and care expected of a reasonably qualified and competent structural engineer so it might be that the house does fall down because there's an unexpected hurricane that's the worst hurricane ever that's happened in in in, in the uk etc if the house falls down provided that the person doing the advice, providing professional services, has used reasonable skill and care, i.e. they did it to the standard expected of their industry, they're not going to then be liable if their design wasn't up to, to some unexpected standard, if, if something, you know, it failed in some unexpected event. That's going further than what the reasonable skill and care provision is. So in a way, your common law position protects professionals because of this assumption that you'll use reasonable skill and care. But, and now we come on to the, the warning of the day really, these um, common law and, and statute law positions allow you um, to, to change that position if you sign a contract that says something else. So if as a professional, you're signing up to a contract, you might think this is fine. Um, I'm a professional providing advice. I can't be sued if I, if I, if I get it wrong because all, you know, if, 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 if it turns out my advice isn't fit for purpose because all that's expected of me is to advise using reasonable skill and care. But, but if you have signed a contract that says your advice as a professional will be fit for purpose, then if it turns out that your advice hasn't been fit for purpose, you can become liable. So in the example I just gave, a, a, a structural engineer designing a house, you know, if it falls down in the, in the one in 10,000 year um, condition, okay, yes, the person has used reasonable skill and care and done the best advice in the circumstances based on the standard of that person's profession. However, if they'd inadvertently signed a contract that says the building you design will be fit for purpose and it will never fail, then you can be liable for that if you've, if you've inadvertently signed a contract that says that. And this is very, very easily done. So, <clears throat> and what we want to do is to, as professionals, make sure we are reading and understanding the contracts that we're signing up to and looking out for a term that um, goes further than reasonable skill and care. So you've got reasonable skill and care here, you've got fit for purpose up here. As professionals, we always want to be making sure that our contracts are just um, limited to using reasonable skill and care. And the best way to do that is to make sure it's literally written specifically in the contract. Now, when you sign up to your professional appointments, um, whether your client is a developer or a, or a main contractor or, or whatever it is, whoever you're working for, if they're giving you a proper consultancy type professional type services agreement, you will normally find that one of the early clauses is a reasonable skill and care clause. It will say the consultant shall provide the services using reasonable skill and care, or it might say the consultant should provide the services using the reasonable skill and care ordinarily expected of a similarly qualified and experienced consultant providing services similar to the services. That's great. So that if you've got that clause in your contract, you're generally fine, provided it's drafted to override other things. 
I will come on to the next slides to see an example of where, where this, this, this didn't work. So if you've got that in your contract, you're generally fine. And the reason that it's good because a failure to use reasonable skill and care as a professional is that's what the definition of, of negligence is, of, of, of professional negligence. So as a professional, this is the standard of skill and care you're expected to use. If you fall below that, then that's what negligence is. And that is why as professionals, we all have professional indemnity insurance. And your professional indemnity insurance responds and protects you where you have been negligent. So say um, you gave some advice and it actually wasn't, you know, it wasn't to do with fit for purpose. It was you, you failed to use reasonable skill and care um, and it was proven as that was negligence, i.e., you know, you went to court and some other you know, expert witnesses from your client said, actually, yes, um, you know, it wasn't that what a, what a, pro what a, pro a properly qualified archaeologist would have done in the circumstances. It did fall below the standard of reasonable skill and care. Well, you know, then, OK, it's a fair cop. And that's where your PI insurance will respond. So any losses that flow from a breaching the standard of skill and care, fine. That's what your PI insurance is for. However, you do need to note that the PI insurance will not respond when you haven't been negligent. I'm sorry if it's getting a wee bit complicated at this point, but effectively, if you have inadvertently signed a contract that says that you are going to um, not use, you're going to go further than reasonable skill and care, and your, your work is going to be fit for, a per, for the purpose. And then it turns out that it's not fit for purpose, but you haven't been negligent. It's just you've done everything properly, but you've inadvertently signed a, a fit for purpose type provision in your contract. Your PI insurer is going to go, well, bad luck. You're on your own. Um, you're, you're uninsured. You shouldn't have accepted that. So going back to our unfortunate structural engineer who inadvertently signs a fit for purpose provision in the contract, he might go, well, I used all the reasonable skill and care expected of a structural engineer. This unexpected event happened. The house fell down. Oh, gosh, I've got this loss that I'm liable for. Um, oh, never mind, I'll go to my PI insurers and they'll go, well, hang on, you've signed a contract that says that what you're doing is fit for purpose. So that's not an insurable loss as far as professional um, negligence goes. So again, we need to be careful. <sighs> So having given you all of the warnings, I need to sort of maybe go a wee bit further and, and say that um, fit for purpose also in your contract won't necessarily even say that. There's other wording in the contract that could make your um, obligations become absolute fit for purpose type obligations. So we've got some examples here in, in the, in the um, blue text. So if it says the con consultant warrants that the works will comply with the specifications or the consultant guarantees that when complete, the work will satisfy performance criteria or the consultant shall ensure that the design life, um, the design will achieve its design life of 10 years. All of these type of things effectively are absolute obligations, which again is rising, sorry, raising your duty of care as a consultant to this next fit for purpose type of level. And you're getting up to sort of obligations there that as a professional, you should be avoiding. You need all of this type of provision caveated with an overarching reasonable skill and care provision. So again, it, it, can, it can be costly if you've inadvertently signed up to something that goes, goes, goes further than, than you should. And again, um, I'm saying on this slide about the professional indemnity insurance not, not responding to, to anything that is, is, is goes further than just this, a breach of skill and care, i.e. beyond the, the standard negligence. So, you know, if, if, if you as a professional, you've used reasonable skill and care in your design and they haven't been negligent, but the, the structure fit, the structure that you've designed or the advice that you've given fails I and mean, it doesn't have to be such something as dramatic as a structure failing it could be obviously somebody relying on the advice you've given if because in in sort of professional world quite often it will be um you know if you've got a fitness for purpose provision in your contract that sort of says um the, the consultant sort of guarantees that the advice is you know meet some sort of specification or something and then your client relies on that advice and it turns out that what you had done wasn't correct you can have that sort of loss for um, those, those claims um, coming back at you. 
And um, so you just do need to be careful. And the example that's come through the courts in recent years on this, which I hope demonstrates the, the issue without startling everybody too much, was this um, Hogard and Eon um, a case that, that came up through the courts, the English courts over the last couple of years. What happened here was that it was for the design, the, 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 um, it was about the designer of some foundations for wind turbines on an offshore wind farm. So um, what happened was that the, effectively that the foundations for these wind turbines were designed by the um, contractor and the contractor was told in the contract to use a certain design standard, this DNV um, standard to wind turbines, you know, standard J101. And the, the, the contract said that the, they should use that standard. They did use that standard, but it turned out that there was an error in that standard. And the factor, it was, it was, I can't quite remember what it was, but it was something like the factor of safety on the design of these foundations was wrong by a factor of 10 which meant that actually the design that was then done based on this, this contractor's work was it effectively, it failed. And it meant that they had to dig out all of the foundations for these wind turbines and regrout them all at a cost of 26 million euros. So um, that was, the, the question then was, had the contractor or the designer in this case, done things properly what did the contract say what was the obligation of the of the design contractor in this contract reasonable skill and care or fit for purpose and it all came down to how the contract was worded so effectively there was two elements in the contract as as probably most of your professional appointments you'd be familiar that there was a terms and conditions of the contract and they had the um the nice sort of reasonable skill and care type of wording in there. So the contract it, uh, said that the contractor designs the works with due care and diligence expected of appropriately qualified and experienced designer. So effectively, that's a reasonable skill and care type of thing. It's not really a much of a higher standard than that in a professional manner with good industry practice. And the good industry practice, I believe, was sort of defined as a reasonable skill and care type provision. And then it also says that the works when completed by the contractor shall be in accordance with this agreement and shall satisfy any performance specifications in this agreement. So you're getting a little bit off the reasonable skilling and the care thing there because it says that the works when you've designed will satisfy the performance criteria. So that was in the contract in the, in the terms and conditions. Lower down the contract, there were some employers requirements that said that um, the contractor shall use the um, design standard uh, for uh, for wind turbines which as I say is actually where the error was and then right down in the bottom of the employer's requirements in section 3.2.2.2 which must have been the document was probably about this thick and this is way at the back of this document there was a little stinger in the contract that says that said the design of the foundations shall ensure a lifetime of 20 years in every aspect so what actually happened is that in the, um, the Court of a, a Appeal, the judge in the Court of Appeal said, well, hang on a minute, that was so deep, buried deep, that 20 year design life thing was so buried deep in the contract that it wouldn't be reasonable to have expected that um, ensuring a design life of 20 years was the main criteria of the contract. And they, all these other nice reasonable skill and care type things up at the front of the contract um, were the overarching things and they should be taken as the overarching things um, and that was the finding of the, of, of the court of appeal but that they the other side then counterclaimed it up in, up in, and took it all the way up to the supreme court and the supreme court looked at all of these contract documents again and they actually decided that um there was a, it was a very clear obligation in section 3.2.2.2 at the back of the contract that said, yeah, you know, the, the, the design will ensure a 20 year design life for these foundations. And the contractor had failed to receive that, to, um, to achieve that, and therefore they were liable. So effectively having this fit for purpose type obligation written way back in the contract, because those um, bits earlier on in the contract weren't rich, written as overarching reasonable skill and care provisions, um, they didn't sort of trump what, what was later on in the contract. So um, 
the, the, the court sort of said that they should give full effect to all of these technical requirements in the contract. And it didn't matter that it was buried deep and there was other loads and loads of documents forming the contract. There was um, enough in there. It was that particular sentence was clear and it was a fit for purpose type of thing. And therefore the contractor that had done this design was indeed liable for the redoing of all of these foundations to the tune of this 26 million euros. So therefore, this made everybody go, ah, you know, that's that, that's a quite a, a quite scary. So um, from this day forward, all professional consultants, whether they be designers of things or you know, um, ar archaeologists, architects, engineers, whatever, need to be careful that we're really reviewing all of our contracts properly and making sure that we're looking for an overarching reasonable skill and care provision. Because if that had been the case here, then the reasonable skill and care relying on a design standard that you're told to re um, rely on, that would probably have been enough of a defence. But for the fact that something else was buried in the contract more deeply that held them up to the higher fit for purpose standard. So the, the lessons that we need to learn from this sort of horror story are that the standard of care expected from professionals is generally this reasonable skill and care reasonably you know, performs the level reasonably expected of other qualified and competent people in your profession. But remember that if you sign a contract that says something else, you will be held to that other standard, you know, and quite often it might be a higher standard. So you need to be careful of what other higher standard wording you may have in your contract. Innocent looking wording can actually be fit for purpose. I mean, quite often I'm, I'm asked, like people say, well, hang on a minute. It says that, you know, as the, the consultant shall meet the specifications. Well, you know, of course the client wants the consultant to meet the specifications. Yes, however, it's only subject to using reasonable skill and care. We're not building a bridge or providing a kettle. We're professionals providing advice. So it needs to be, yeah, we'll meet the specifications. Clearly that's what we're going to do. Subject to our obligations being reasonable skill and care. And again, whether your overarching reasonable skill and care provision prevails depends on the, over, on, the, on the way that the contract is drafted. Make sure that that is your overriding provision. And again, if there are numerous documents forming your contract, you need to do an overarching, you know, a check through everything and make sure that what you've got at the top of your contract, your reasonable skill and care is actually the overarching duty. Most forms of con most contract packs have an order of precedence of the documents in them. So generally, you'll find that your terms and conditions do actually override what's lower down in the specifications and all the other schedules. So if you've got something in a contract that says that, then you're probably going to be OK, um, provided that you've got your overarching reasonable skill and care provision in that top document in the in the contract pack. And then what you'd be wanting to look for is just some wording like this that's unambiguous and clear. So here we've got a lovely example, notwithstanding anything else to the contrary contained in or applied by this contract, the contractor's obligation should be limited to performing the services using the level of reasonable skill and care usually expected of an appropriate skilled and qualified contractor experienced in undertaking work similar to the works. If you have got that sitting at the top of your contract in the highest precedence uh, document, then as professionals, we can sort of read the rest of the contract and go, oh, phew, our PI, you know, if, if, we, if we don't perform to this standard, our PI insurance is there to, 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 to protect us. They'll be happy with this wording and we can sort of be comfortable that we're not inadvertently exposing ourselves to risk that, that, that we, um, we don't want to. So anything, again, lower down the contract, if you've got that up above, if you've got your scope of work that then has all of this, the, the, the works will comply with X, Y, Z, the work will be fit for purpose. You can always add another sentence just for clarity at the start of those clauses lower down the contract. Again, that says subject to this, you know, if, if this is in clause one, subject to clause one of the terms and conditions, we will design the work so, 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 um, so that they're fit for purpose or whatever, so, provided that it's caveated by, by, by this. So that is uh, the, um, the main crux of, of, of 
what I wanted to say really, I mean, it was just literally um, focusing on, on, on this, this one point to, you know, if you're getting a new, next time you get a contract from one of your clients over the next couple of weeks, just make sure that you have a quick look at it and make sure that um, you're not falling foul of, of, of any sort of sneaky fit for purpose obligations. And that as a professional, um, you know, archeologist, architect, civil engineer, contractor, anybody providing services, that we're making sure that all of our contract obligations are limited to reasonable skill and care. I shall take a sip of water now. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, very much. Um, because we have a small number of people, I'm just gonna unmute everyone. And so if you have questions, you can ask them. Um, just to get us rolling, Rachel, is there uh, any great difference between English law and Scots law on this point, or are they very similar? As far as I know, I'm, I, I'm, I, my studying has all been in English law, but I understand that, uh, is it the same? In, the, in Scots law, they have delict and not negligence, but I, I think it's effectively the same. If you and your Scots law contract put in reasonable skill and care, and that's what's expected of you, I think you'll be okay. But um, if in doubt, look up a Scottish law book, <laughs> Scots law book. But as far as I know, um, it, it's the same. In most of our wind farm clients and uh, contracts in Scotland, to be honest, they tend to be under English law, but um, yeah. As I say, the, the, the term for negligence in Scots law is different, but the principles I, I believe are the same, but I'm a little bit wary to, to advise on that. Understandable. And it looks like a couple of people have unmuted their mics. So if you want to ask your questions. Hi, yes, my name is Deborah. Uh, thank you very much. That terrified me and at the same time lifted my spirit up uh, because <laughs> I now know what to look for in, in contract. Um, I have a very similar question uh, as Kenneth, but on a European level. Um, because I'm, I'm from a different country and because I hope in the future we can, you know, work uh, somewhere else outside Britain as well. Would that be also recognisable in contracts with European companies? Or? Again, it's 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 pretty similar, um, but you do have in some other parts of Europe they have more sort of strict liability provisions where you don't necessarily get yourself protected. For example, in French law. I understand that there's a pretty strict rule that if a building collapses or whatever, you've got a strict liability in there that everybody that was involved in design and building, it takes a share of, of the responsibility. So even if you've tried to protect yourselves um, in your contract for reasonable skill and care, I believe that there are some sort of statutory sort of local law that, that do, you know, have a more strict liability type of um obligation on, on 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 designers and professionals so be careful again and and and, and look at the the local um look at the local uh, rules because most other um european countries are civil law countries as opposed to common law countries so rather than it have developed through a load of case law you've got more sort of formulae writing down of all the rules and you can go to you know as i say in french law for example you, you will have this sort of strict liability written into, into, into the law. So, so again, I, I would urge caution. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, it's um, Hester Kupreed here. I was just wondering if it came to it, kind of who decides on fitness of purpose? Because especially for something like archaeology, it's a little bit difficult to know what fitness for purpose is. Not that yeah. you want to go down that route anyway, but I, I'm just sort of always curious, really, because of the way the nature of the work that we do. It's not like we're providing. It, it's not easily defined in a sense. Yeah. And I, I, and I, I think that, to be honest, that's probably in the archaeologist's favour, I would I would think, because, I mean, I don't really, I, I was trying to get a feel for this earlier on speaking with Doug as to what type of things in your, con, what, what type of, um, what is your scope? Because when you're providing advice, is it, uh, uh, what is the deliverables? You're, you're providing reports as to, you know, what's on a particular site or whatever. 
I mean, yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's, you're saying I, I, you're not saying. It, it, I suppose it'd be something like, I, I guarantee there are no priceless Roman ruins in this bit of land. You can build a motorway. You know. Well, I don't even think it would necessarily be that. So it's kind of interesting, really, because I suppose. I think the problem we have is that that we often get, you know, you you get a contract, you know, a hundred pages thick, and and the tender deadline's next week. Mm, yeah, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, well. obviously, you can look out for the key things, but in some senses, the risk of it, if it happens, the risk is catastrophic, but the risk of it happening is kind of small, if you know what I mean. Yeah. For some of these sort of clauses, because fitness for purpose is largely decided by. A third party and once our reports or whatever we've written are accepted then you would argue they're fit for purpose because they've been accepted by the people that need to accept them and, and, and there and is I, very little residual risk but on the other hand someone might argue that you said in your report there's a low likelihood of archaeology on this site and now we found a lot more so I don't know yeah, yeah I, I, and I, but I think that's probably there's other ways that we can sort of protect ourselves then with that type of thing, because if, if it is that you're assessing a level of, of, of risk, um, presumably in your the way you, you advise, it is that that, you know, I'm, I'm advising you that there's a certain sort of percentage risk of something being there. But then presumably you have sort of very standard sort of caveats it's just based you know because you can protect yourself by going based on the information that i've got from my um, data search or whatever you've done and site surveys etc i you know um and then i suppose that's you just put your reasonable skill and care based on that you, you put the constraints of of the work that you did and the limitations of doing it and then also try to limit the extent to which the the, the you know your client can 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 rely on it because it might be that it does get superseded by other things that, that happen later. And in fact, and, and that's, I suppose that's, that's that reliance thing about yeah. relying on something, because obviously the state of knowledge changes and um, most reports that we write potentially out of date within six months. So if the client yeah. doesn't use them in time, passes them on to somebody else, then they might not be valid for that that use again kind of yeah. thing. Now, what I would say on that is a sort of slightly different point, but very much related is make sure that if that is the case, I know you've got, you know, you're saying that when you're, you're bidding, it's difficult to look at the contract, but the type of thing you want in your contract there is actually sort of a, those sort of constraints on your advice. And ideally, you'd have the better off place, those sort of constraints in the contract rather than in your report. So if, if you've got it in your contract that the advice you know, if, if 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 things become different in future, or if the situation changes, you're not liable for updating your advice. It's based on a snapshot at that time, etc. And put those type of provisions in the scope of work. And if it's clear in the scope of work in your contract that those limitations apply, write them in the report as well. And then you know you're very much sort of pr pr protected that the the boundaries of what your advice is 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 clear from a you know as and limited to reasonable skill and care then it would be very yeah, I mean, it's in, for... in, when we but, kind of um often get tenders the tenders are on the basis that we accept the contract and when you kind of then um issue a response to ask whether the contract can be changed the answer is often no so indeed, in a yeah. sense what we're doing is we're assessing the risk of actually entering a contract which we perhaps think isn't necessarily as good as it should be <laughs> Yeah, I know. And, and it's very difficult. And, you know, they'll say you're marked down, you'll be thrown out if you put any qualifications to, to the, the contract. So it's always a sort of delicate path to try and sort of say, well, you know, can we just talk to you? Because actually there's some things here that, you know, it's in both parties' interest to, to change and, you know, it would be better. You know, so if you can't get it into the terms and conditions as as such and it's that that's the part of the contract that's more difficult to change then you've got the hopefully there's more flexibility in what the actual scope of work is i suppose and you can try and get those protections in in the scope of work it's not as ideal as being able to mm. check for your nice um overarching protection in your terms and conditions but actually you know within the constraints of the scope of work that's another place where you can put all of those limitations and caveats and things but yeah uh, i know the process is difficult i mean yeah that, that it's my role to sort of deal with all of this and you know it's a delicate path it depends on and it also depends on your, how how strong your position is compared to your client's position in the negotiation you know if you if you're if there's not many competitors then that's all well and good but you know yeah, okay thanks
Anybody else got any comments or, or questions? Um, well, okay. I'll stop, the, or Kenneth, do you have a okay. question? Yeah, uh, just, just quickly, I mean, for, first of all, the, that last question, Hester's question about the thinking when the client presents you with their standard TNC and you just have to accept was what I wanted to ask you about, and thank you for answering that. I just had a slightly perhaps more trivial question. Back to the case study you showed about the the wind farm. Could the could the consultant not then could their lawyers then not pass pass the legal liability on to the publishers of standard J101 when the standard was found to be at fault? I think that I would say if I was in their position, that would certainly be something that you know one would be looking at. You can't really, it's not really reasonable, is it, to publish a design standard and then it have a, an error of, of that um, scale in it. Um, I haven't actually seen if there's any sort of cases, you know, if, if there's been a follow up on that. But yes, I mean, one would think that there, 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 would, there would be a case there. Now, it wouldn't be that that um, none of the parties would have a contract with the publisher of that mm. design standard. So it'd be like a, a sort of common law negligence type of claim because putting out a standard and, you know, you have to take responsibility for that. And, the, and you know, as far as the publisher of a standard goes, it's reasonably foreseeable that people would rely on the advice in your standard. So there'd be like a torturous sort of claim route there potentially. But, you know, it's whether they, it's, it's time, money, Mm. risk of not succeeding that that puts people off doing these things but yeah i mean i it certainly um it certainly seems a little unfair doesn't it that um yeah it, it's 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 it it doesn't seem like a fair outcome considering some of the the, the, the factors if you if you look at it like that yeah thank you um rachel so in archaeology we have not an official standard but um, there is an organization, CIFA, that has um, sort of standards and guidance um, that in many cases are quite vague um, that they publish, there's no, they are a chartered institute, but there's no requirement to use any other standards and guidances usually. Um, Occasionally subcontracting down, that might be from an, one archeology span organization to another might say you have to use it. Lots of people will put in their reports, we followed CIFA guidance, et cetera, on, um, you know, uh, survey or anything like that. Would, would those be something you can rely on if it's say a third party organization has put together some sort of survey and guidance, even though there's not any legal backing to it? I, th I think that the, the, the point is that it's how you hold yourself and what you hold yourself out to be. I mean, it's not that your clients are also always going to go and look for everyone's degree certificates and chartered body, you know, certificates and things. But if you hold yourself out as being a professional person, you know, that's going to come and do this work properly to this to the accepted professional standards, then that is the standard that, that person is going to a pass or fail against it if, 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 it, if it comes to it. So, I mean, the way that negligence type cases are uh, assessed is effectively the way it's, it's by expert witnesses. So, you know, you're def the, the, the claimant and the defense will both have um, their expert witnesses and provided that the balance of that is, um, yes, all of us in our profession um, or there's, you know, your expert witnesses come and say, well, within the standard expected in the profession, this person, yes, I would have done the same in the same situation based on the information I had at the time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if, if the, the, the weighting of, of the, the balance of the sort of decision in, in the court, say, is, is that, yes, in fact, that person did do what was reasonable and expected of a professional you know whether they've got the, the actual certificate or not but you know what's appropriate for somebody that's holding himself out as being suitably qualified that would be the standard that that they're, they're judged against so again i mean you know like i say i'm a chartered civil engineer if i go along and try and sort of advise somebody as a chartered you know I, oh yes i'll come and design your bridge for you 
and then I don't do it. The fact that it turns out I'm actually a, a pretend chartered civil engineer or whatever, it doesn't really matter because I've held myself out as being qualified to do that. And that is the standard that I'm going to be judged against, you know, or, you know, if, if my 17 year old son says I'm a chartered civil engineer, I'm going to come and do your, your, your bridge for you, you know, well, a bad luck sam you shouldn't have pretended you are because you're not going to be judged as a 17 year old you know if you've hold, held yourself out as being the person that's quite you know being qualified and capable at that level that is the standard that you're judged against so that's what really matters so the fact that you have got a professional body professional qualifications etc does have some meaning and you know that if, if if a case like this went to the court that would be what the standard would be judged against you know you'd get your professionals people that are qualified and in, in that area and say well this is what's expected of a properly qualified archaeologist and and, and that's what somebody would be judged against if, if that makes sense thank you rachel and uh, thank you Sinead, for that question because that that's pretty much what i was thinking i mean we do have cifa as a professional association it in my opinion, it it very weakly certifies people's competence. It it thinks it does, but it's never been tested. There's never well, it has been tested, but never tested to the level of it going to a court case and then having to provide expert witnesses for one side or the other. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Most of these things don't go to court cases, do they? But you know, it, it's it's even if we're just settling something in a dispute with a client and we're sort of shaking hands over a, a, over a settlement, you, you, you need that that is the sort of way that your arguments would go. Mm. You know. Yeah, thank you. I, I partially asked because I'm on the committee for CIFA on reviewing the standards and if there's anything we could bring into that review now that would kind of safeguard us for the future, it would be good to know. Are there any other questions? I was just going to ask a question for Kenny, really. I mean, is there any kind of movement in fame to to perhaps try and develop some model sort of terms and conditions for that archaeologists can use? Or is that too much of a legal minefield? We talked about this at the webinar last week in the questions. I asked Tariq Mian from Tarragate about where, where can we go to get standard TNCs? And he said, speak, speak to your solicitor or buy, buy the off-the-shelf ones from, uh, for example, ICE. The idea of standard TNCs for archaeological business is, I think, as you say, the potential for a legal minefield and fame. Fame doesn't really have an appetite to then being the ones that would have to carry the can. For having produced such a thing or perhaps maybe some guidance on how you go about making sort of you know not necessarily saying you do this you do that but no i mean know, i think a lot of this stuff is quite interesting and people probably um sign on the dotted line without thinking about it too much uh, and uh, a bit more yeah. kind of not necessarily guidance but perhaps <laughs> awareness of the sorts of pitfalls maybe Yes, and I hope that's what this series of webinars is the first step towards. This is making people aware of the pitfalls and the elephant traps that they should avoid and giving them some idea about how you might. But yeah, as you say, the people are still relatively underinformed. The there's only a few of us here in this meeting. Ho hopefully more people will see the, the recording later. And hopefully more people will look at the other webinars in this series and we might pull something together at the very end that's a kind of a, a little document reviewing and pointing to pointing to things within the webinars that people can specifically pay attention to if they hadn't been in here already. I think that's as far as we'll be able to go in the short to medium term. So presumably you're working on clients' terms and conditions most of the time, I would imagine. Almost always. Sometimes I'd say for some of the smaller projects when you have, um, say, uh, someone who wants to do, you know, build their own house or something like that, who is a private individual, um, they usually won't have terms and conditions, but that is a very small portion of our members work and it tends to be a very 
niche um, niche sort of bit of work. So for the most part, it is working to with larger clients. Yeah, yeah. For death-based assessment, you can often need your own terms and conditions. So um, if we don't have any more questions, I think we can draw this to a close. Mm -hmm.